everyone, and welcome back for another fantastic episode of Adventures in DevOps. I'm one of your hosts, Nell Shamrell Harrington. With me are my co-hosts, Lee. Lee, how are you doing today? Man, I am just living the dream. Living the dream. Glad to hear it. And Scott, how are you? I am well. I rested and relaxed from a couple of days off. Oh, fantastic. I am looking forward to Labor Day weekend uh, coming. Well, when we're recording this, that's uh, coming up and getting some rest and relaxation myself. Yes. One ambition I had early on in my career was actually to build iOS apps. And so, of course, my solution was to start a podcast talking about how to build iOS apps. And so we asked around, we got some ideas, and eventually Josh Susser from the Ruby Rogues podcast put up the idea of the iFreaks show, and that's what we called it. You can find it at iFreakshow.com, and every week we're talking about iOS development and Swift and Objective-C and libraries and reactive programming and all of the things that go into making good iOS apps. I don't run the show anymore, but we've got Andrew Madsen, who puts together the curriculum for Lambda School. We've got James Uber, who's been doing iOS development as a freelancer for a long time. We've got Mike Holt, who's a good friend of mine, who's worked in Xamarin and in Swift, and currently does a bunch of interesting work on that. And we've got other people that we're bringing in all the time to make that show better. So if you're trying to keep up on all of the advancements that Apple makes, all of the announcements from WWDC, and you want to hear from people who are doing this day in and day out, and talking about it, and teaching people about it, and doing the work with it, then you definitely need to check out iFreaks. You can find it at ifreakshow.com. That's I-P-H-R-E-A-K-S show.com. Awesome. Well, for today's episode, uh, we're going to talk about getting started in DevOps or learning DevOps principles and technologies. Uh, this week, I also recorded an episode of the another one of the uh, devchat.tv podcast, DevEd, uh, around the idea of learning DevOps. And I thought it might be a great way to go, it might be a great thing to go deeper into it uh, here in our DevOps dedicated podcast. Sounds like a good idea to me. Love it. So I guess maybe let's start talking about our own experiences. Uh, Lee, how did you get started in DevOps? What were you doing before? And wh how did you shift or did you shift? Um, well, I, I started as, as an old school uh, rack and stack system administrator running, uh, running mail servers uh, at my college. And this was, this was well before uh, you know, DevOps was even a thing. Um, but even back then, the, uh, the, the culture was kind of automate or die, at least among you know, the, the, the higher echelons, you know, people who wanted to get out of the data center type things. Um, I, I was introduced to an organization called LOPSA, uh, the, the League of Professional System Administrators. Um, and that was sort of a, an unofficial uh, you know, m uh, mentorship uh, relationship with dozens of, of experienced sysadmins. Uh, I'm, I'm still a member of, of LOPSA today. Um, and a few years ago, I, I changed, uh, I, I, I volunteered for their, uh, their mentorship program as, as a mentor. And I've, I've had a handful of mentees over the years, uh, trying to get people up to speed from all walks, all walks of life. You know, people who, uh, were system administrators, who were developers, um, who were, weren't even in the industry, but wanted to, to get into it. And it's been, you know, it, it's been a very, uh, fulfilling experience. Awesome. Scott, how about you? Uh, you know, it's funny because I have very similar start in being like a, a Windows sysadmin back in the day and doing a lot of a hodgepodge of a lot of different things and uh, even programming early on before I would consider myself like a full on programmer. You know, I did some cold fusion, I did visual basic, uh, you know, some VB scripting and started doing PowerShell when that came out. Uh, you know, the, I would say the, you know, for me, the kind of the big shift towards focusing more on automation and deploying code, you know, I mean, I can, I definitely just don't, I, I do not look back to the old days of having to FTP changes and, and, and everything. It, it, like whenever I started, started using fabric, you know, probably eight, oh God, yeah, it was probably seven, eight years ago to, to do deployments that really changed a lot for me. I'm a Python guy. So you know, I, of course, look for the Python tool, ch tool chain, and that was kind of the start of it. And, you know, I've probably been using CI, CD stuff for about five years and uh, really kind of revolutionized the way we deployed our apps in my business. And, you know, we have three different sites. So that was three different pipelines and all that good stuff. So um, I really uh, enjoyed the value of it and, and kind of have come into 
you know, gotten a lot more exposure to it as I've done consulting. And it's been a lot of fun to, to kind of see what, how we've kind of exchange all this, you know, physical infrastructure for all the software infrastructure that we get with the cloud and have really enjoyed it. Awesome. Well, for me, uh, I came from a development background. I was a Ruby developer and a .NET developer. And in my .NET days, I would do what we talk about being the old way of doing things. This was 10 or so years ago. I would uh, write my code in my little .NET app in my Visual Studio editor. And then I would put it together in a zip file and I would send it to one of our system administrators to deploy it. And I remember I took a little bit of interest in how he did that and I would look into the folder on the shared file system where the site was kept and there'd be the regular site folder and there'd, there'd be old site, old site two, old site three, old site four, et cetera. <laughs> so we had all these different builds of the site still kept in one place. We weren't using version control. We, we weren't doing any of that. Now, then I got a job as a Ruby developer at a hosting company uh, called Blue Box, which was acquired by IBM a few years ago. And in it, as a developer, I was developing in Ruby and Ruby on Rails, but I was responsible for my own systems. And before the job, I had done some tutorials. I learned how to use Heroku. I, I thought it was going to be like that. Uh, it's not. What I found is I have great admiration for like the old school system men who could keep the configuration of 10 different servers, all number one, do it all by hand, and number two, keep all of the different flags and such in their head. I am not one of those people. I have great respect for it, but it's just not something that I am wired to do. So what I found was I some of our sysadmins, uh, our traditional sysadmins, were using Chef. So I started exploring it, and I realized, oh, I can capture how this should be configured in one place and have it stay with that configuration by using a Chef server and a Chef client. And then if I need to make changes, I only need to make changes in this one place. And I think the same can be said for any uh, configuration management, whether it's Ansible or Puppet or SaltStack or Chef. And that really was a wake-up call to me. And I took some more interest in infrastructure as code. A few years later, uh, Docker was just at the start of becoming big, so I started exploring that. And I found I really liked the kind of system programming space. And so eventually moved on to Chef, where our business is DevOps and infrastructure automation and have been doing it ever since. That's awesome. Yes, love it. Yep. Uh, so what would you all say if someone, let's say someone who's taken a coding boot camp, uh, is really good in Node.js or React, et cetera, and they come to you and say, I want to learn DevOps, where would you tell them to start? Oh, man. Um, so for, for all of my mentees, uh, I've, I've been recommending a, a series of, of three books. Uh, they're all uh, primarily by, by a man named Tom Limoncelli, although he has a, uh, a fair amount of, of co-authors uh, that I just can't remember off the top of my head. Um, but the books are The Practice of System and Network Administration, um, the Practice of System and Network uh, Administration Part 2, and Time Management for System Administrators. And, and those, th those are the three books that, in, in my opinion, you, you can build a career on. They're, uh, they're technology agnostic, so they work well for you know, Unix, Linux, BSD, um, Windows. Uh, it's, it's all about good practices, and it, it really tries to instill a, a curiosity and, and troubleshooting mindset of trying to understand what's going on you know, underneath the, the automation and the, and the shiny APIs. So when it inevitably breaks, um, you're, you're not just sitting there dead in the water. You can, you can peel back the covers and go, oh, okay, well, this is, you know, this is where I can start digging into you know, what has gone horribly, horribly wrong. Um, there, there's, of course, the, the standard uh, Google, um, uh, Google books. Uh, as far as publishers, you know, O'Reilly's fantastic. Uh, no Start Press, Manning, you know, all, all, all of these publishers have, have great books on, uh, you know, managing systems and, and things like that. But as far as getting, you know, 80 to 90 percent of the way there uh, without, without necessarily going deep into one specific technology, uh, the, the, the Limoncelli trifecta uh, is, is where it's at. Nice. Yeah. The, um, I, what are the, you know, I was going to kind of definitely echo 
focusing on understanding some of like the core systems administrative tasks. And a lot of this around surrounds understanding basic networking, understanding basic Linux systems and commands, maybe even doing a little bash scripting. I mean, it's de definitely good, important to understand some of these core fundamentals of these systems that you're going to be interacting with. I mean, if, if you know, obviously script, you know, writing code is an important part of this, but understanding how everything interacts is, is just as important. Um, if you don't understand ports and DNS and, um, you know, how things, how networking works, how there's time to lives on things. And, you know, understanding the browser, I think is a very core piece of this. And I think, uh, I think nowadays there's a lot of video content out there. That's really good. There's a lot of stuff that's free just on YouTube that if you poke around you can search for specific things that you're trying to understand. Like if you're trying to understand DNS or, you know, maybe IP networking and that kind of thing. Um, IPv6, I'm sure a lot of people, even modern sysadmins are behind the curve a little bit on that. And um, I know I'm not super well versed in IPv6, but uh, it's definitely coming for us. And, uh, you know, so I think those are all like really, really important things. And obviously there's things like Linux Academy and Cl a cloud gurus, but those are going to get, they're going to get you really specific help around deep knowledge on specific products, um, oftentimes specific clouds, you know, Google, you know, and I think that, that to me, that's also a huge thing is like, you know, like, where do you think you're going to focus? If you just finish like a Ruby boot camp, um, then you're well versed or you're well prepared to take on, you know, Puppet and Chef, right? Um, but, uh, you know, Salt is probably, that's all Python based. So maybe that's not as exciting <laughs> or Fabric is also a Python based one. So I think all of these things um, direct your energies. You know, if, you know, if you're a Ruby guy, if you're a Ruby person, maybe you don't want to be working in large corporate enterprises that are all, that are 90%, uh, you know, Windows. So that's just my little two cents. <laughs> Got it. Well, for me, when someone comes to me and says, I want to get started, I've had a few people do that. My first piece of advice is pick a cloud provider. I used to recommend AWS, but it is so many services now, it's, it has gotten more and more complex. So I actually often recommend DigitalOcean because it's a lot simpler and they have fantastic tutorials yes. on how to set up, you know, set up a server by hand, uh, how to uh, you know, deploy an application to it. It's a great way to, you know, get your feet wet and the basics that you learn there, you will then be able to take to any cloud provider. So that's one. Love it. And the other is if someone was coming from a pure JavaScript or Node.js or React background, I would advise them learn one other language. And I, what I would suggest, again, if this is more of a beginner person, I'd say you get some experience with some Ruby and some Python. I had some students come to a meetup I was helping host once, and they said they'd just been through this great cloud, uh, you know, cloud programming, and you're, I'd say more of a cloud system administration course, and they were trying to find jobs but they didn't know how to code or they didn't have enough comf com comfort with code in order to be able to demonstrate it in the interview setting. Uh, so my advice to them was, you know, you get your feet wet with Python, learn the basics of, you know, variables, if else loops, et cetera, get that foundation and that's going to take you pretty far. Right. Learn uh, Zed Shaw's uh, Learn X the Hard Way series has been great. I'm, I'm working my way through uh, Learn Python 3 the Hard Way myself. And for, for me, at least, where they, they give you something that is, you know, 90 to 95% there, but something is suddenly broken. And then it's like, okay, knowing what you know from the previous chapters, troubleshoot this and, and make it suck less. For, for me, that really works because I, I like problem solving and, and logic puzzles and, and things of that nature. Yeah, I mean, you really need a project. I mean, it's, it's really hard to kind of learn these things in a vacuum. Um, you know, and so you're better off if, even if it's a lot of little small projects, you need things that you can actually work on and make progress. And obviously when you make them open source, then you can show them to people and it can help you get jobs and all those fun things. My, um, my LOPSA, uh, curriculum has, has been, um, for a while. Okay. You know, this is presuming that there, there is some expendable income to, to go into this, but get, get a domain. It doesn't need to be like an, an amazing thing. It can be, you know, a, a $5 a year, you know, dot XYZ. It, it doesn't matter. 
because we're, we're only using it to learn on. Great, you have a domain. Now get a, a VPS from you know, DigitalOcean or Linode or there's some, someplace cheap. It doesn't have to be you know, off the hook performant. Um, and, and then we go through, okay, we're gonna install Bind and you're gonna run uh, you know, domain name services for this. We're, we're gonna try to load up a static website that uh, you know, it can be just an ASCII HTML page. Great. Then we're in order to to learn about um, you know databases. We're going to install WordPress, and oh, now you now you've got a nice little you know BS blog running on your domain. And then we're going to go into you know very basic email hosting. And if you if somebody wants to get into the you know the dark arts of email hosting, yada yada yada. And all all of this at, at this point is very much like by hand, and it's very bespoke. And when we when we get far enough down, then I'm like, okay, now we're going to delete all of it and we're going to go into um you know pick uh pick pick your configuration manager of choice you know puppet or chef or ansible or whatever then we're going to go through and we're going to put all all of this configuration that you did by hand because now you know what working looks like we're going to put all this into code and then we can talk about ci cd and you know uh push push to deploy and and testing and why that's important and it, it takes about eight months to a year for you know the the average somewhat technical but not necessarily seasoned person, um, but it's you know I, I try to go from a you know building up of of the the basic you know the the old the olden arts of you know good God running bind or power DNS or or things like that, um, and then seeing how far we can take it and then what you know legitimately is terrible about this and and why providers like Amazon or Google can um, you know literally print money by providing you know an api to dns because man managing zone files by hand really sucks <laughs> but it's good to be able to know how to do that and when when you inevitably break it uh you want to be able to to go through and troubleshoot and fix it and and that that whole you know break fix process primes the, the student for you know a professional career doing exactly that at a variety of different levels Hey folks, this is Charles Maxwood, and I have people email me all the time with a quick question. So I've started answering a lot of those questions on the DevRev. You can find it at thedevrev.com, and I try every day to answer a question that people have about programming, programming careers, and things like that. You can either go to devchat.tv and click the send voicemail button on the side and leave me a voicemail that I'll play on the show, or you can just email me, chuck at devchat.tv with your question, and I'll answer it. And then go to thedevrev.com and check out the videos and audio that I post there when I have a new show up. Something that we do when we're teaching someone who's come from a pure system administration background chef is we have them write a bash script, you know, a basic one that does the series of commands they want to do. And we take that and put that in a chef recipe. We, 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 we wrap it in a resource so the resource just executes that particular uh, script. And we start with that, show them how it works, show them that it works, and then we slowly start teasing out aspects of that script uh, into different chef resources or di di different aspects with it. So it's very much a kind of learning by doing, learning by refactoring process. That's awesome. I like it. And what, what I especially love about Chef um, and, and Puppet and you know, the, the, the whole configuration management thing is the, the inimpotency thing, deal. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when you, when you have it in Bash, that's better than nothing. You know, that, that, that's better than a poorly written wiki page or hand-scrawled notes. But inimpotency is, is a huge thing. You know, I, I, I apply this resource once and, and don't throw a fit if you have to apply it again is, is killer. Computers never do what you want them to do. They will only do what you tell them to do. It's like my wife once said, wow, programming is like playing a game of Simon Says with uh, someone who never loses. And that's exactly it. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> love it. Yeah. Something else I found is people sometimes come up to me and say, well, should I start with containers uh, if I want to learn DevOps? And my answer usually is no. It's start with virtual machines, start with hand configuring them. The reason for that, and you know, and Lee, you mentioned this with learning the the olden ways to do it, is unless you've experienced what virtual machines are like, or even what physical servers are like, you're unlikely to have that that intuition and that knowledge of 
what containers do really, really well and what they don't do really well. Uh, so you, you know, in knowing what they replace or the things, aspects of that, that they replace, I think it sets you up well for understanding how to use them in the best way for your particular environment. Exactly. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. I was going to suggest that Vagrant is like such a great way to do that because it, you just install this like really simple thing and then it allows you to basically just kind of create like little configuration files and then it just automatically pulls down these different operating systems and allows you to go in there and configure things and install stuff. And they're like really easy to like, like recreate and destroy over and over and over again. And so you literally never have to worry about like managing something on some cloud server or um, that if you make some mistake, it like it's going to like, you know, take a whole bunch of time or whatever. It's just really easy. It's just like one of the easiest tools for managing VMs. So it's almost like there's a there's a certain amount of virtuous suffering that is uh, that's almost a prerequisite for this field. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. I would say if you want to move into the field, uh, I used to work for another company where uh, they were the operate. There was a separate operations team and development team, and the operations team was trying to put together automated environments for uh, developers to have to run their code all in the same place, makes a or same kind of environment makes absolute sense. Uh, but they were debating, and I was in this meeting whether they should force the developers to set it up by hand first so they learn it, or have an automated script that would do it for them. And my, I was actually more in favor of the automated script because unless someone wants to learn the DevOps pro, uh, processes or DevOps technologies and use them as part of their daily workflow, I thought it might be better to really harness the automa automation aspect and let a specialized person continue doing what they were specialized in. Now, I'm not sure if that goes against the DevOps uh, ethos or not, but that, that seemed like the, the best option at the time. Right. Well, there, there's a certain amount of, you know, is it, you know, culture versus commerce there? You know, that, that's in a professional situation for a company that's paying you a salary to, you know, churn out their widget as fast as possible. Uh, and, and in that case, I, I think your, your call of, look, just go right to the automation is, was the correct one. It's, how do I want to put this point? I, I, I think that the going, going into this field, considering that it's going to be just a nine to five job is going to be a mistake. You, you kind of have to love, you know, dinking around with computers for, for lack of a better term. I mean, I, I, I was very fortunate growing up. Um, you know, my, my parents were, were very big into tech and I, you know, I started on, you know, an 808, an 8086 running DOS five. And that was always just an, an ever present thing in the house. As I, you know, it went through the, the repetition of, you know, install this thing. Oh, that broke the entire thing. Oh, you're going to get a whooping unless you fix it before your dad comes home. You know, that, that, that whole thing, you know, then building up into Windows and, and then tweaking Windows to, to run games better. And wow, Windows is really terrible with, with this level of hardware. What's this Linux thing? And oh, God, now I've got to compile a window manager. You know, it just builds on itself. And I, I, I don't think learning, um, you know, good DevOps practices or, uh, maybe good isn't the right word. High performance DevOps practices. I, I think trying to do that and your job within within just a, a nine to five schedule is, is going to be prohibitively challenging. Um, you know, something's going to have to give, and it's you know you should like to be able to do this stuff on your off time to get your skills up, um, and then you know that way you can bring the the learning from that to to your day job. Did that make sense or was that rambling? No, I think it does. Well, I, I think, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, you have to, you have to be really self-motivated to want to learn and experiment and tinker because, you know, if somebody's talking about something, you don't know anything about it and you're not like willing to just go like read Wikipedia or just briefly like understand, okay, what is this thing? Um, then it's going to make it harder for you to, to, you know, you're just going to, a lot of stuff is just going to go flying by your head. I mean, I can remember really, really early on in my career, like people just like throwing out all these different, you know, all these different Linux distros and free BSD or, you know, BSD distros out there. And I'm like, I don't know what any of this stuff is, but just like going out and reading a little bit about it or trying, you, you just have to be curious enough to like kind of understand little pieces of this stuff um, because it's just never going to go away. It's just, the stuff just gets more involved and more complex and yeah. Turtles all the way down, man. 
It, it is tur <laughs> turtles all the way down. Uh, something I found is I, I agree with you that if you want to learn something thoroughly, uh, you do have to at least do some of it uh, in your off time. I have one caution with that is put boundaries in place around it when you do that. Uh, I have burnt myself out to a crisp multiple times by trying to do all the things at all the time. So put, put some boundaries around it. Obviously, still take care of yourself. But I mean, the reality is, yes, you probably will need to do some research if it's something you're truly interested in uh, on your downtime as well. Right. Something yeah, else? Oh, go ahead. No, I was just, I don't know, that's, that's a very important thing to, to point out is self self-care is very important. You know, every having to put in an 80 hour week, you, you know, every once in a while, that's fine. That's, you know, that that's the job. But if you find yourself doing 80 hour weeks every single week, even, you know, that's that, that, that's a culture spell. Yeah. <laughs> that's bad. Right. What I've also found is I know there's often a gulf between going through the tutorials for something at the very basic level and then actually uh, executing it, using it in a professional setting. Uh, again, put boundaries around this, but there are so many nonprofits and other organizations that need technical volunteers. And wow. it's okay if it takes you as a volunteer longer to do something than if you were a paid professional. They're often willing to give you, you know, that, that leeway to research something or, you know, try it a few different ways before you, you find the right way. Uh, for me, that's one of the, the best ways that I, that I personally learn is through, through actually executing it uh, in an environment that's not as high pressure as my, my day job professional environment. Yeah, I, I was going to take a moment to like go back to the Docker thing that you had talked about. Sure. Because I know that it's so buzzwordy, like Docker, Kubernetes, anything that's kind of container related. Like even as well informed as I am, I literally at one point had to create a sticky note on my computer because I still have it like like shuffled way at the back of my desk now about like which side of the like port was the Docker host versus the container. And like, just because I could never remember like which was which. Um, and I looked that like, up every single time still. It, yeah. I mean, that's crazy. Isn't that crazy? It's just like so unintuitive that like, you just have to like, like write it down just to remember this stuff. And, and, the, and, tech, and so like, you know, somebody who's listening, what is a Docker host and what is the container port? The host is basically the underlying system right? So that comes first. And then the container port is our, you know, the port that the containers, the service is running on. Right. And, and I mean, this is like simple at some level, but complex at another level when you're trying to like figure all of these things out. And I, I just think that like, it, it's, it's so like containers are so much more abstract than just something like here is something running on your system. And then like even a VM, it's like very like, oh, it's this system, it's just running over here and it still has its own IP and you log in like a normal computer and everything about it is normal, but you have none of that. You know, you find a lot of times with people with containers trying to do simple things like, well, where can I save things? How do I make sure I save things uh, in, into the Docker container? And they're just misunderstanding that like the Docker container is kind of a, is a read only thing and you have to mount specific areas that write to, you know, either, some mounted share or to the, the, that local server. Um, you know, and a lot of people just, they don't, it's, it just makes the, everything is so much more abstracted that it's really, really challenging to kind of like conceptualize everything that's going on and, and, and Kubernetes and stuff, just, it just magnifies that it may be like squared almost, you know, with all the networking stuff and, you know, these service layers that, that are like, can helping all the containers talk to each other and you know, it's just really, really complex stuff. So the, the, the marketing behind Kubernetes and containers in general has been fantastic and relentless. <laughs> and, and honestly, I, I think that most startups that are, that are trying to do an MVP, trying to start out with, with Kubernetes, um, if they, if they aren't actively shooting themselves in the foot with that decision, they're, they're absolutely, you know, holding the loaded revolver and eyeing their big toes suspiciously. I mean, uh, containers and, and Kubernetes in general are just, they're a very specific um, optimization for an environment. I, I, I think that trying to, to call them a, you know, that, oh, that's where we should start. I, I think that's a mistake, personally, just, just me. Yeah, I agree. 
Yeah, I, I personally do as well. And that's why uh, one of the rec places, also the places I recommend people start, and I'll put a link in the show notes, is there's an op school uh, open curriculum uh, that goes through the very basics of operations first and you know, gives you that foundational understanding uh, before you move on to the higher level things like uh, containers, Kubernetes, et cetera. Uh, so again, so you know what the benefit is that they're giving, well, how to evaluate whether they're giving you benefit or not and know what it is they're abstracting away and how to use those abstractions. Absolutely. You, you, you don't need to go, you don't necessarily need to go you know, full container netties, you know, Blurin deploy micro API uh, to, you know, greatly improve your, your mean time to recover. Do you guys have any suggestions on where people would start with monitoring? Because I don't really, I'm, I'm sitting here trying to think of what I could say smart about mo learning monitoring and stuff like that. But it's, so, there's so many, it's, it would almost be like learn CI, CD, but there's like literally 50 of them. So I just, I'm curious if you guys have any thoughts on that. I would recommend Lee's friend's book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You yeah. remind us the name of the book and the name of your friend, Lee, who we're going to be interviewing I, I, in, a, in a later episode. <laughs> I think you were talking about Mr. Mike Julian. I and, was. And his wonderful book, uh, Practical Monitoring. So at, uh, at Fine Bookmongers Everywhere or, you know, Amazon.com. In, in general, you know, it, 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 like so many things, it depends. You know, do they, do they just want monitoring when, um, when something goes down and, and alerting? Uh, I think Sensu is a wonderful place to start. If they're if they're looking for, hey, we we don't really care so much about uh, waking somebody up in the middle of the night. We we really are. We get more business value around you know, graphing trends and being able to see what our what our you know load is over over time. Uh, you know, Prometheus uh, or Grafana that that's tacked on to um, you know, an influx DB or, or graphite backend or, or something like that. That's, that's all going to be great. But there, but you know, there, there is no one, uh, you know, one end all be all monitoring solution. Um, there's just, you know, pick, what do you want out of your monitoring system? And you're probably going to have to, you know, piece together uh, three or four different things in order to, to asymptotically approach that. A couple of years ago, I put out a survey asking people what topics they wanted us to cover on devchat.tv, and I got two overwhelming responses. One was from the JavaScript community. They wanted a React show. And the other one was from the Ruby community, and they wanted an Elixir show. So we started both. The React show, though, is React Roundup. And every week, we bring in people from the React community, and we have conversations with them about React, about the community, about open source, about what goes into React, how to build React apps and what's going on and changing in the React community. So if you're looking to keep current on the current React ecosystem and what's going on in React, you definitely need to be checking out React Roundup. You can find it at reactroundup.com. So we've uh, talked a lot about how you learn the, the various technologies associated with DevOps. I was wondering if we could shift a little bit, because I mean, we, we've said on the show before, DevOps is both a technical, tech, or DevOps is both a technical movement and a cultural movement. And I'm wondering, where would you suggest people start with if they want to learn some of the cultural elements of DevOps? Ooh, that's a really good one. I personally would recommend Effective De DevOps by uh, Jennifer Davis and Catherine Daniels. It's a fantastic introduction to it. I would also recommend reading The Phoenix Project, which I think we've, we've recommended a few times before, which yeah. is a fable about a, an organization that is in technological crisis and it's very, very familiar and how they learn to dig themselves out of that crisis, partly through uh, embracing DevOps principles. All right. I, I think that those, that's great uh, to get insight into the, the, the commercial aspect of the culture. Um, I, I would recommend going a, a little bit more old school and, and checking out some of the writings of, of cats like Richard Stallman, uh, Eric S. Raymond, um, and, you know, just, uh, the, the K and R book, uh, you know, pro, you know, there's some like, you know, the, the art of C programming, um, to be able to get a good, uh, a good steeping in the, you know, almost anarchist libertarian, you know, open source Uber Alice, uh, that sort of underpins in, in my opinion, uh, the majority of, of the industry, um, trying to figure out, you know, where, uh, you know, the, the people from the, the seventies, eighties and nineties were, were coming from. Um, 
and the whole you know code wants to be free. You know, the the, the net interpret censorship is damage and routes around it, um, stuff like that. And something else I would recommend because uh, DevOps is also so much about how we treat each other when we're working together in technology. Uh, the book Crucial Conversations by Carrie Patterson, Joseph Grenny, and a few other people is fantastic for learning how to communicate with people when stress is high and when the stakes are high. Uh, one of the things I learned from them was the importance of needing to, when people are emotional, de-escalating at first before trying to bring in any sort of logical arguments or such. Because when people are in an emotional state or in a defensive state, they're not going to hear the logical arguments, and right. it needs to be de-escalated first. Right. And what's just a, a cautionary tale to the, the young people listening. Um, you know, the, the folks that I mentioned earlier, you know, Eric S. Raymond, uh, Richard Stallman, they're, they're not necessarily known for being the most um, compassionate people. <laughs> I, that, that said, you know, I, I think there's still a lot of really good stuff that, that can be learned from them. But, you know, Nell, being, being able to temper that with, hey, you know, conversational skills and, and dealing with people, that's, that, that's definitely critical, uh, especially in, you know, today's employment environment. Yeah, all, all great recommendations. Um, one of the things I was going to suggest is the Google um, Site Reliability Engineering books, which are free um, and available on that you can read online. Uh, you know, obviously, if you want a print version, you need to pay for it. But uh, I think I really... I think that early chapters are really good to the talking a lot about um, how teams can be accountable. Uh, a lot of this is more cultural building, but I think there it's a good foundation for a lot of how you should think about things, how you have error budgets and you know, the, that, that, you know, you don't want developers throwing a bunch of really buggy code over the wall that causes a lot of problems for the, the DevOps folks. And so the, you know, there's this tension that they try to, this balance that they try to create by creating this tension where like, if there's too many problems that are created by the, you know, the new code that the engineers get involved in kind of maintaining the systems or whatever. I think that's, I think that's really smart and important stuff. Uh, so I think that's one that's really good. Awesome. Well, anything else we should discuss about how someone gets started with DevOps, both the culture and technology uh, and I guess we could, we should cover it. How do you keep learning? Because thing about DevOps is you're never going to be done. Uh, right. I have to disappoint a lot of customers who come to me <laughs> wanting the, the magical DevOps appliance that they can put in their data center and magically everything's going to, going to, going to be better. Uh, that, that doesn't exist, I'm afraid. Uh, so how would you recommend people continuing to expand their knowledge uh, in DevOps? Ooh, that's, <laughs> that, that, that's a, that's a deep one. Um, Get out there in the field and and do it professionally. You know, try try to talk with your um, your your business partners to put an, an, an extra corporate spin on it. But you know, ostensibly, you know, as a as a DevOps practitioner, you're working for somebody. You know, I, either in a leadership position or as an individual contributor. Um, try to figure out what matters to the business, whether that's you know uptime because. You know, lives are on the line. You know, if, if you guys have a, a cloud kidney dialysis machine, that's that's a terrible product. Nobody ever invent that. That sounds um, horrifying. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, figure out like in the grand scheme of things, how mission critical is is your uh, particular chunk of product that that you are supporting, and figure out how to to measure what actually matters, and in in your practice. Um, Work on work on making the you know the, the business people happy, and and that's you know that that's going to lead you to oh well maybe I don't need to do you know this aspect of of what's in all the DevOps blogs because I'm um, I'm measuring this um, this metric because that's what actually matters, and so we can up you know you're you're gonna and everything about this is going to be customized very very deeply to you know, your specific business problem. Um, and figuring out what that business problem is, is, is half the battle. Sounds awesome. Uh, Scott, what would you recommend? You know, I mean, I, one of the things, I've done a lot of writing and reflecting lately. Um, I do a lot of writing that doesn't get published. Uh, I'm really bad about going from written to published. But uh, one of the things that I've, I've reflected on is that most of my career, like, 
I feel like I never solve the same problem twice. I feel like I'm always being introduced to new problems. And the only thing that's really um, stayed consistent is things like programming languages, understanding like core technologies, like getting really solid on a, in, program, in your programming languages, getting really solid in you know, networking and understanding some security stuff has really translated over the years in my comfort and progression. And um, so I think those things are really, really important. Um, and, and, and I'm never, I don't feel like I'm ever done with that. Um, I've, you know, even today I'm realizing how um, limited my knowledge of bash scripting is, even though I'm, you know, because I'm actively trying to improve my, my skills around that. And um, the, and, and, and also learning go and stuff like that, because these are things that translate, you know, over and over again. And so I think for me, it's about like understanding that a lot of these different things might be somewhat ephemeral. Like we like, we go from, you know, like there's not probably that many people migrating to VMware nowadays. Right. And so that was something that was a big deal for a long Some parts of the world. Yes. But yeah, less I, in the United States. Yeah. I, I guess what I'm just saying in general is like, I, you know, there's a lot more people now it's now they're going from their VMware clusters to the cloud and so those types of things. Right. And, and, um, and I just, I see that technology keeps changing. Like what is going to replace EC2 and, you know, these compute things? And is it just going to be serverless stuff? Maybe, I mean, I don't know, but I feel like we're just going to continue and continue to try to take away um, things that are not adding business value. And what are the things that add business value? Are there these very generalized tools and that is programming languages and, 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 and I think even the configuration, I think the Ansible's, the chefs and those things are, are essentially, and it, those are very specialized extensions of those things. So I don't, I wouldn't necessarily say that those are what I'm not talking about. It's just that I've had more, um, you know, I've had more longevity over programming languages versus specific tools personally. Awesome. Well, for me, my recommendation is DevOps days events. There are a ton of these. I just counted, and there's 13 coming up in the month of September alone. They are all over the, the U.S. and all over the world. Uh, there is very likely one, if not this year, the next year, that is near to you. Uh, they are generally not very expensive to attend, and they are a fantastic way both to you know, hear presentations. Um, I'm speaking at DevOps Days Buffalo uh, in September, where I'm going to be discussing my experiences working with DevOps on political campaigns. Uh, so you hear all those conversational stories, but the hallway track really is the best thing because you get to hear from other people who are trying to practice these technologies and practice these principles, hear what they're struggling with, hear how they might be solving it, and how you uh, might solve it in different ways yourself. So highly recommend if you haven't been to a DevOps Days event, definitely check one out. Nice. And in, in that vein, uh, LOPSA puts on uh, a lot of similar events nationwide. Um, they, they tend to be much smaller, uh, but they are free. Um, and they're, I, I would say they're probably not quite as prolific as, as DevOps days in you know, very large urban areas. Uh, but Seattle has a LOPSA chapter called SASAG, uh, you know, Seattle Area Systems Administrators Guild. Um, and they, you know, monthly meetings, free food, free attendance. Uh, Feel free just to show up and see what's cooking. Awesome. Another place also to check out, uh, talking about things that are free and meetups, is uh, Linux users groups. Uh, if you want to get a start in operations or such, those are great places to uh, talk to people who are experienced or people who are new themselves and learn from them. Uh, the one in Seattle is called G Slug or the Greater Seattle Linux Users Group. Uh, but I bet wherever you live, there's probably one near you as well. Most likely. Definitely. All right. Well, shall we uh, move on to picks? Let's do I it. Awesome. And my pick this week is a little weird. It's the Herb Tarragon, uh, which is, you know, it's in season right now, very fresh. And it, it, I've, I've, I've you know, used dry tarragon for a long time, but using the fresh stuff 
the wonderful sweetness it adds to things that I cook. Like I love cooking big pots of soup because I can, you know, freeze three quarters of it and then have, you know, quick dinners available for the next month or so. Uh, but the wonderful sweetness and freshness that the fresh stuff adds is fantastic. So if you like to cook, I definitely recommend fresh tarragon while it's still available. I, I love tarragon, but I don't think I've ever had it fresh. I'll have to check that out. Thank you. Awesome. Lee, you want to do picks? Sure. Uh, my picks, I'll just post them right here in the channel, um, are those three books uh, that I, I mentioned earlier. Uh, the Practice of System and Network Administration, um, Parts 1 and 2, and Time Management for, sy for Systems Administrators. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> nice. Scott, what about you? Um, so, I, you know, I'm going to go back to, to kind of an older, no, it's not that old, <laughs> but uh, more than 20 years old. Um, and I actually would generalize it and say uh, you probably, um, you know, if, if you're, especially if you're, because this is career, this is kind of the career change or new career kind of episode of sorts, I'm going to recommend uh, like Zig Ziglar books. I think his, the one I'll specifically recommend is How to Stay Motivated. Um, I think he has just an incredibly charming way of kind of engaging with the audience and having silly folksy stories. Um, but I think he, you know, a lot of this stuff he reinforces is just about, um, it, it, they're, they're, they are essentially mental models, even though he would never call them those. It's just ways about like how to be like, you know, how to be useful to the world and not to be focused as much on yourself and those types of things. And I think he just is, he's fun. You know, the, the, the thing to do is to do the audio where you can, in my opinion, because you can listen to him and he's got his, you know, Mississippi accent and it's just really fun and charming. And uh, I think, you know, you can even start just by searching on YouTube for some Zig Ziglar. So Z I G Z I G L A R. So that's his name, Zig Ziglar. Awesome. Well, thank you, uh, Lee and Scott, for uh, being here. And thank you, everyone, who's been listening. Uh, and we will see you next week. Well, may not see you, but we will, we will uh, be present with our voices next week for you. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com to learn more.